Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on how to use FSTA on Web of Science. Our presenter today is Carol Hollier, Information Literacy and Outreach Manager at IFIS Publishing. Carol joined the IFIS team in September last year and has had over 10 years experience as an instruction librarian at universities in the UK and the US. After Carol's tutorial, we will have a question and answer opportunity. So if you have any questions for us, please send them in using the chat facility at any time during the webinar, and these will be addressed at the end. My name is Hannah Casbolt, and I will be on a live chat throughout. Now over to you, Carol. Hi, thank you, Hannah, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Um, so I would like to begin just by saying that like very many people in the world um, right now, I'm working from home. So excuse any background noise that may come up. Um, I hope there won't be any, but I can't necessarily guarantee that there won't be any. Um, and as Hannah said, please do share questions throughout um, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end, but some, some of your questions we can answer during the webinar. So we'll be very happy to have them come through as, as they come up for you. So today, what I want to do is talk about how you can use FSTA on the Web of Science to efficiently and effectively search for food science information. So the session today will begin with a bit of an overview of what kind of information it is that you will find in FSTA and we'll look at how you use basic search in the web of science um, search engine. And then we'll also look really specifically at how you use the FSTA thesaurus to shape your searches to really pinpoint the information that you need. Um, we'll also look at the advanced search function in web of science, and we'll look at some of the other features that you can use, including filtering your results, and analyzing your results. And finally, we'll end with an overview of additional resources that you can turn to for helping you search well um, as you're using this tool. So let's dive in. As I said, we're going to start with a quick, a very quick overview of the kind of sources that you'll find. So FSTA is a database and like most databases, the bulk of the information that you'll find in it are journal articles. And that's because journal articles are a very common way that research outputs are written up and shared with the world. Um, but it's not the only kind of source that we have in FSTA. So we also have a pretty substantial chunk of patents in there. And patents are a way that we're able to help you find information about research that's been done often in a proprietary setting. So it's not in necessarily in a university, um, but it might be where people don't want to share the outcomes until they can actually capture it for monet monetary um, purposes, but you can still get an insight into the research that's been done. Uh, there's also other formats of research outputs like conference proceedings. Um, so things that haven't necessarily been written up into papers yet, reviews, and a miscellaneous um, smattering of uh, theses and reports and some book chapters and books, and also standards. So if you look at it from another angle, we also are focusing on food commodities. So everything that is in the database has to do with the sciences of um, food and health. So it is, as you can imagine, really crossing the spectrum of food commodities. So including things to do with pet foods. And finally, we do it in all sorts of different disciplinary contexts because the science of food and health Scientists of food and health are very interdisciplinary. So this gives you a quick overview of sort of the spectrum of information that's being added to the database all the time. So how 
how do all these sources get into the database? Many databases are now compiled using artificial in uh, intelligence, but our content is actually managed by a team of scientists. So that's our editorial team. And they vet all the sources that we include in FSTA for quality. So we're confident that we're not indexing any predatory journals. Another difference between ours and many other databases is that we seek out relevant material wherever it might be published. So we don't have a cover to cover policy where we necessarily have a list of journal titles and we put everything in there. There's, it's true with some journal titles that every single article in it will be indexed, but we go beyond that where we'll go to business journals, but find relevant um, food science information and just pull in those articles or within some of the medical journals. Um, if there's something really relevant to food science and nutrition, we'll pull that in, but we won't pull in the information that's not relevant to food science and nutrition. So that really makes us unique, that it helps make our content really, really comprehensive and always relevant to food science. So we also have global coverage including material that's been published in 29 languages from publishers in 60 countries. So how does this relate to your searching? How do you find the information that you need to find within all of that content? So FSTA has been designed to help you find the information you need. And the main backbone for doing this is our thesaurus because we've comprehensively indexed all of the records that are in the database. And so this means that we have assigned subject headings that are relevant to food um, or nutrition to every single record. And we have in our thesaurus more than 13,000 subject headings. So to give you a sense of the thesaurus, if we think about spirits, you can see the kind of specificity that our, our thesaurus gets down to. And you'll also see that if you're searching for spirits within FSTA and using the thesaurus to do it, you won't accidentally find anything about um, ghosts because we're thinking about spirits in terms of the, um, the food science and not in terms of um, of, of, of it in different senses of the word. So now let's actually turn to the database itself. Um, so I need to, I need to go to it, which will take just one moment. Thank you, Carol. While you're doing that, uh, just a reminder that if anyone has any questions at all, send them through to us and we will discuss at the end. Thank you. So here we are in the Web of Science. And at this point, you may have different things that you see depending on the way that your FSTA subscription is set up. So you might notice that here I've come into the web of science and I have select a database and the default is web of science core collection. Um, if I look at this menu, I've also got two other options. I have FSTA, the food science resource, which is what we're going to look at today. And then there's also an option of all databases. And if I were at a university, chances are I would have a much longer list with other specific databases here. Um, and so the Web of Science core collection is actually the Web of Science's own database, which is very large, very, very, um, you know, it's a, it's a great database, but it's not specific to food science. FSTA clearly is specific to food science. And you might have other um, databases, some of which will be from independent entities like FSTA is, some of which will be more specific web of science databases. Um, so for instance, Biosis Previews was about biology, um, or there might be Cab Abstracts, which is about agriculture. Um, so you really need to pay attention 
to your own screen to see where you're coming in. Because if you don't, you might think that you're searching one thing and be searching something completely different. Um, so if you're searching the core collection, you're only searching the core collection. If you're searching all databases, you're searching the core collection plus any other databases that you have. And then if you go into the specific database, then you write in that database. And so with FSTA, it's really worthwhile actually going into the database itself because that gives you the option to use the tools to do the best searching. If you're searching all databases, then you'll still be searching the records, including FSTAs, but you'll be doing it in a very generalized way and you won't be able to use the, the thesaurus specifically to find what it is that you want. So let's go to FSTA here and the screen will shift a little bit. And so now I can see that I am an FSTA and I'm on the basic search screen. And the basic search screen is actually very sophisticated um, in, in web of science. So it's my favorite screen to search. Um, even though advanced search sounds like it's gonna be more sophisticated, it gives you the capacity to really control what you're doing and build a lovely search. So I'm gonna show you what you can do with it. So here, I'm just going to start with a very simple search, nutrition. And notice that here, there's a pull down menu and the default is topic. And if you are searching topic, then you're searching the title, the abstract, and the descriptors or keywords fields or subject heading fields of the record. So I'm gonna show you what that means. So I'm just gonna do this very simple search. And we got an awful lot of results, 65,000. Um, and if we go down a little bit and open up this result, just by clicking on the title that opens up the record for you, then we can see that the word nutrition was here in the title of this article. It also appears in the abstract several times. And then we have down here something that's called keywords. Now keywords are the descriptors or the thesaurus terms that are actually uh, um, assigned to each article so by the editorial team to make it so that you can find what you need. And so I can tell from this one, it's nutrition is not one of the keywords. And so that tells me that in a way this, this article isn't really, really, really focused on nutrition as such. And when we look at the keywords that are assigned to it, we can tell that it's about consumer demand and response and health promotions and so forth. So, and food supplements. So it's about nutrition, but it's not about nutrition as centrally as one of the articles that would have nutrition as one of its keywords assigned to it. So, if we go back to search here, then one of the really nice things about Web of Science is that we haven't lost our search. It's still there and we could actually um, build on it from here if we wanted to keep going with nutrition. But what I'm going to do instead in this case is show you some of the other options for searching. So title means I would just be searching the title field. Um, author inventor, when you click on that, uh, I'm going to get rid of nutrition here. You can see that we've had uh, a link come up for us, select from index. So that gives us a chance to search. So I might search for Smith. 
which I'm sure there's many, many Smiths in this index, because it's a common surname. Um, and if there was somebody I was looking for in particular, so Smith AK, I could add them. They get added there. I click OK. They've, that name, that person has been added to my search box. And if I search, then I actually get the 24 articles that were written by this person. Sometimes they're, well, no, actually, I was going to say sometimes they're the first author, but I'm not sure if they ever are. Yes, in this case, in the sixth one down, they're the lead author. Um, and they're another author in the ones above. Um, and so that's a way that you can find the research by a particular person. Let's go back to the search fields though. Um, and so there's other options. So you could look just for a publication name and look at everything that's been published in a particular journal. But if you want to get to the, to the keywords, the thesaurus, then you need to go to this descriptors link. So you click on that. And again, I'm going to get rid of clear out Smith. And you'll see that we have a new link here, the select from the thesaurus link. And so if we click on that, then that lets us start to actually search the thesaurus. And there's really sound good advice here um, that when you search the thesaurus, you should truncate your term because that will give your term more flexibility and you'll be more likely to find what it is that you're looking for. So the example they gave here was wheat, type W-H-E-A-T, and then truncate it. So a space, no space, and then the asterisk. Um, and it would find both some words that have wheat or some terms that have wheat in them, but at both the front and the back of the phrases and something that doesn't in any apparent way. So I'm gonna show this with another example, waste. For it, so imagine that we're looking for information about waste, very important topic right now uh, in relationship to food. And I'm typing it without a truncation symbol. And when I do that, the only result I get is wastewater, which isn't necessarily what I was thinking of. If I amend that, to truncated waste. Then you'll see how my list has expanded. So waste water is still in there, but I have things like food factory wastes, dairies wastes, and then I have wastes. So it turns out that in this case, the thesaurus term is wastes, not waste, um, but I wouldn't necessarily know that. Uh, if I click on the T here and view the thesaurus details, then I can see that here's my term waste, and then it's got a lot of more specific, narrower terms. It's also got related terms. So we'll look at this a little bit more in one moment. So I'm actually going to do the same kind of search with yogurt. And I'm going to spell yogurt with the American spelling, Y-O-G-U-R-T. And I'm going to truncate it again and click find. And when I do, you can see that I'm getting quite a long list of results that have to do with yogurt. You can see that the ones that have yogurt that's spelt the American way, so fruit yogurt here, are lower lowercase letters. And the ones that are spelt the British way, Y-O-G-H-U-R-T, um, are all capitalized. And this is significant. Um, the, the, ones that are 
the capitalized versions are the official terms. And if we look here at soy yogurt and open up with a T view the thesaurus details again, and scroll down, then we can see a really big used for list. So all of these terms, soy bean yogurt, soy bean yogurt, spelled that way, soy yogurt, soya yogurt, soya yogurt, soya bean yogurt, in many variations, are all different ways that researchers around the world refer to soy yogurt. And what the thesaurus does for you with these used for terms is pulls together any instance when one of these other forms of it, like soya bean yogurt, has been used by researcher and it indexes it under soy yogurt. So if I were to search, if I were to add soy yogurt to my search down here and then go ahead and search it, which I'm not gonna do right this minute, I would actually be pulling in all the results with all these different versions that have to do with soy yogurt. So the work has been done for me. I don't have to be aware that researchers might say soya bean yogurt instead of soy yogurt because the indexers have done this for me. So it's one of the ways in which FSTA's thesaurus really helps you be comprehensive and not inadvertently miss research that's relevant because of the terminology that different researchers use around the world. So now I want to actually look at soy yogurt in the hierarchy. So the hierarchy is the H. So we've looked at it as the thesaurus term itself. But if we look at the hierarchy by clicking on the little H, then we get to see it in terms of the tree where it falls. So the top of the tree for soy yogurt is foods. And then when we scroll down, we can see that we're getting to plant foods. And then vegetable products, soy products. So it's getting more and more specific. And every time there's a plus, I know that there's more specific terms underneath that. So in this case, soy yogurt, here we are at our actual term, and there's no plus next to it. So there's no narrower, more specific terms than soy yogurt in the thesaurus. So now I want to start putting these into action. And I want to build a search using the thesaurus. Um, and I'm not going to do it with soy yogurt, but I'm going to do it actually um, with a question around soy sauce, which is conveniently right next to soy yogurt. And so the question that I want to investigate is how how does um, fermentation actually affect the flavor? How does the fermentation process affect the flavor of soy sauce? And looking specifically at bacteria in the fermentation process. So this means with this question, I have four different concepts. I've got the soy sauce question, concept. I've got the fermentation concept. Uh, I've got the flavor question concept and I've got bacteria. So I need to build this um, one piece at a time. So I'm going to start by opening up soy sauces, looking at it. So I can scroll down quickly and it's highlighted for me so I can see it quite easily. 
and I can see that there are some more specific terms under soy sauces, but I think I'm just going to stick with soy sauces, so I'm going to add this to my search. Now, unfortunately, I already clicked on soy yogurt, and I can't get rid of it right here. So I'm just going to click through, add this to my search, and it's been added to my search box, but I'm going to take out the soy yogurt because my search actually has nothing to do with soy yogurt. So I have my first term added to my search, but I have three other terms that I want to deal with. I want to think about concepts. So this is where basic search lets you build the search really nicely. There's an option to add a row here. So you click it and you get another search box. And you want to put each concept of your search in a different box. So I'm going to use the thesaurus again. So I go to topic, but I go down to descriptors so that I can search the thesaurus. And so the next, the next um, concept I'll look at is fermentation. I'll truncate it. Don't know if I need to or not. In some cases, for instance, with coffee, if you search coffee just typed out as that, you get 20 results and or 27 results, pardon me. But if you type it as a truncated um, word, coffee with a potential to be coffees, you also get 27 results. So it made no difference. But you don't lose the 27 results if you truncated it. So with fermentation, probably that's the right way, but I'm going to do it anyway, just as good practice, do the truncation anyway. Scroll down here, I see fermentation. I'm gonna look at the thesaurus details. Um, and so there are some specific narrower terms. Sometimes related terms can be very useful. But in this case, again, I'm just going to use this thesaurus term. Click OK. And it's been added to the second box. I'll add another row. And once again, go to descriptors so that I get that thesaurus link again. And so, now, I'm going to, I think I'll look for flavor. Truncate could be flavors. So flavor is not the capitalized version. So I'm going to scroll down and find the official thesaurus term, flavor with a U. And here it is, and it has a number of narrower terms. So in this case, I'm going to add flavor itself, but then I'm also going to add umami because that's really relevant to soy sauce. Um, and so I think that I want that to be another option. And you can see, I'll click OK. And you can see that here I have flavor added and then it's connected with an or. So that's telling the database when I finally hit search that I want to find results that have the word flavor in them or they have umami. And if they have both, that's great. So one or the other or both. And you can do that not just with two terms. You can do as many terms as you want to. So as many variations um, of the concept as are actually useful for you. And then I'm going to add one more row. And the last thing that we were thinking of was bacteria. And I don't think that there would ever be a bacteria, but again, it's good practice to truncate. And here I can see that there's 
a lot of options about bacteria. I'm going to go to bacteria itself again. Um, and there are an awful lot of options of narrower, more specific kinds of bacteria. So I'm going to add bacteria and then I'm also going to add bacillus, which is a term because of my exploration of the topic earlier that I know tends to be related to my question. So I hit OK. Now I've got four specific terms. And when I've got two different words to cover my concepts, they're connected with the ors. And each concept here is connected with and. So what I'm telling the database is I want to have records that have soy sauces in them and have fermentation and have either flavor or umami or both and have bacteria or bacillus or both. So I'll hit search. And I get 13 results. And you'll remember that I searched all of those as descriptors. And so I know that in each of these 13 results, the, it has all four of the concepts here in these subject heading keywords. And so all 13 of these results are incredibly focused on exactly what I'm looking for. So they're very, very targeted searches. Now, I could be happy with that, or I could say I don't want to be quite so targeted. And I can go back to my search and actually broaden it by changing it from just a descriptor search to a topic search, which you'll remember means that we're searching in the title, abstract, or descriptor fields. And so all I need to do to do that is change this to topic, but then I also have to do a little bit of work with making my search terms more appropriate for a topic search. So the first thing I'm going to do is make soy sauces a phrase so that soy, soy sauces has to stay together with the two words next to each other. So, and I'm also going to truncate this so it might be about soy sauce or soy sauces. Um, with fermentation, I'm going to truncate it so that I can get results about fermentation, but also about fermenting or fermented or just ferment. Um, and again, I need to change this to topic. Um, with flavor or umami, I want to truncate flavor so it can be flavor or flavors, but then I also want to add in flavor spelt the American way. So in case flavor wasn't a subject heading, but it was in the title or abstract, um, then I would still capture those that were published in journals that used American spellings. So, and finally, I don't think I need to do anything with bacteria or bacillus, but I do need to change both of these to be searching the topic so that I'm searching all three of the fields for everything. So hit search. And you can see how that really expanded the number of results that we have. So we went up to 75 from 13. Um, so if we open up the top one and scroll down, we can see that here we have bacteria, fermentation, soy sauces um, in the keywords, but we don't have anything to do with umami or flavor. And so whether or not this is an advantage or not depends on the purpose of your search. Um, sometimes you might decide that it's really useful to make some of your terms 
um, only in the descriptor fields and some that can be more broadly um, located across the record. Um, and there's other times when you'll think that you want them to all be kind of broadly, but when we look at these um, more closely, some of the results you'll find, I don't think this is a case of one, um, but some of them will just be talking about how you get sort of a soy sauce-like flavor in other soy products, which might not be relevant for what you're looking for, or it might be. It really depends on the purpose of your search. So now, if we go back to our search again, you can see that we have the option for advanced search. Um, and so we'll go to that and I'll show you something that you can do in advanced search that you can't do in basic search. So when we go to advanced search, if you scroll down, you get your search history. And so that's helpful both to see what you've been doing, but also it's very helpful if you want to just um, to combine search history or, or, or past searches. So what you can do is, for instance, I can decide that I'd really like to take out, I'd like to look at all the searches where I searched my terms or all my results where I searched my terms as topic search and weed out all the ones where they were descriptors, so the 13, so that I can look at what's happening when I've just got them as topics. And that might make, help me make a decision about whether this is a search that I want to use or if I want to actually um, adjust it to make it more useful for my purposes. And so the way I do that is I say, I wanna look at all the results in search number four, except the results in search number three. So I go up here, it tells me, you can see there's examples and tutorials, which are really handy, but I can go number four, not number three. So that's another Boolean search operator, just like and and or are. Help us, they all help us control our searches. And so I got 62 results, which I knew I would because the math is really straightforward. But that's when I can start looking at what the results actually are. So here's, here's one where it's the soy sauce like aroma, but it's actually in spirits. So it's not exactly about the flavor of soy sauce itself. So um, that's an introduction to searching in, um, in Web of Science. Um, if you have any questions, I hope that you'll put them in, uh, in the chat so that we can answer them soon. But I wanna show you a couple more things before I leave my demonstration. Um, so if I go back, search again, so I get my search results, I wanna show you some things that you're able to do. So um, when you have the results, you also have options down the side to refine them. So you could search another, another term within the set that you have. So I could say, I want to have aroma in my records as well um, and then hit search and then just come back with whatever records had that additional search term, term in them as well. Um, you can see how many you have that are open access. You have six open access um, results. So I could, oops, I could filter by those and just get directly to the text. And there's some really useful information about what kind of open access results you're looking at because there's a variety of gold and green um, results that you could have and there's an explanation of what that means. And you can also search uh, a filter by years or by our sections. So for instance, if you wanted to look at the patents, you could just look at patents exactly or here's another option to just look at the journal articles or conference proceedings, et cetera. 
Um, and then down here at the very bottom, there's something called analyze results. And analyze results is really nice. Um, if we click on it, and I want to show you that it, there's also the option to analyze results up here at the top of your screen. So it's the same thing. Then we wait a minute and it will actually give you a visual breakdown of the results that you got. And you can decide how you want to um, organize them. So for instance, if you wanted to organize them by languages, you could see that 70 of them were in Korean, I mean, in, in English and four in Korean. And there's, in this case, it's the same length of list below, but often most of the results show up here, but then there's a longer list down below, which you can export um, if it's useful. You can also see where people are publishing their research about soy sauce. Um, so if you're doing research there yourself, you might target some of these, um, these publications. Um, so this is really, really fun to play with and useful as well. And you can actually click on any of these to view those records. So you can go straight through. Um, if I go back to the previous page, then we have other ways, um, other things other things that we can do, we can uh, control how we're sorting our results. So the default is to um, do it by date. So the most recent publication will be on top, but you can also do it by relevance. So that's quite common in databases where there's um, a formula about where your search terms fell within the record and how many times they appeared in a record. That, that will order the results for you. But one thing that's uh, unique to Web of Science is this time cited um, result. So it will show you the articles that have been cited by other researchers the most, um, so in order. So you can see that this one's been cited by 44 um, other publications, other, other articles, um, and they go down. So one thing to always bear in mind with time cited is that so if something's been published really, really recently, nobody's had a chance to cite it, but it's a way where you can identify um, important research in a particular area. Now, if you click on this, if you're at a university where you also have access to the Web of Science core collection, it's actually looking at it within that database. So you'll be leaving FSTA. So if you want to return to searching FSTA, you have to get yourself back into FSTA. So that's just something to be aware of. So um, you can also export your records to reference managing management software. So Mendeley or Zotero or EndNote, whatever you might have access to or use, and um, so you can keep your research organized that way. You can also email your stuff, yourself records, and you can keep marked lists within an account that you set up um, in the database. And finally, I'd just like to point out that you can set up an alert. So here, this is nice. If you open that up, you can see your search as you composed it. So this one's topic, soy sauce, and then and, so the next concept, ferment, and flavor or flavor or mommy, and bacteria or bacillus. And if I created an alert for this, then any time a new record was added to the database that fit that search, I'd get an email about it. So it's an easy way to keep up to date with particular searches that you might be invested in and need to keep on, on top of. So what I want to do now is show you some um, other, other resources for help that you can turn to when you are searching. So first of all, I'd like to point out that there is help built into Web of Science. So up here, 
on this help link, there's both help which explains how your results work and there's all sorts of different um, information in here. So here's the information about open access types. But if we go back to, to this, oops, um, there's also a training portal. And so that's really helpful. I'm not sure if this is going to show for you if I have to change my sh um, screen sharing. So I actually, I'm going to go back to my, to my PowerPoint um, where I've got this on a screenshot for you. So bear with me for one moment. Thank you, Carol. While you're doing that, just a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions at all, then please do feel free to send them across. Um, also, we are recording this webinar and the recording will be sent around to everyone who registered for today's webinar um, in the next couple of days. Thank you. Okay, so before I get to the the um, training portal from Web of Science. I'm going to show you one thing that you can use to actually help you keep track of your own research, which is a search matrix. So I'll show you where you can find this in one moment, but this is a way where you can keep track of the concepts and the variations of words that you might want to use. So in this case, it's it's been used for a question of how does safe Design processes impact the sensory quality attributes of beef. So it helps you break down the question into concepts and then capture the different words which you might find in the thesaurus and you might just brainstorm yourself. Um, and then you can see how sometimes a concept that you initially um, capture turns out not to be as useful as you think it would be. So for instance, meat really is a broader concept than beef, but if you search meat, you'll get stuff about beef, but you'll also get stuff about chicken or pork. So if you're trying to do research on beef, you don't really want those. Those just clog up your, your results. You can also see with this how the ands are used to connect the different concepts and the ors are used to connect the concepts as they are appearing in different forms, so different being captured by different words. So here's the promised screenshot of the Web of Science um, uh, training portal. And you'll see that you can actually sign up for more training um, specifically about Web of Science if you're interested in it. And it's offered in many different languages. So not just in English. And there's um, the link to it both within Web of Science itself and here is us, um, the web address for it at the bottom of the screen. And IFAS um, has also been producing a number of resources to help you with your searches so, um, and your search practice. And so we've created uh, and recently published a best practice and literature searching guide, which is available on our website. And it's been reviewed by um, top scientists in the field from around the world. Um, and so it's a place where you can find those templates of the search matrices. And it's also got lots of different information about, for instance, how you evaluate your sources, when to, your results when you get them back. Um, finally, we've just created a journal recommendation service. So if you're in the position where you're wanting to publish um, research yourself, it will help you find non-predatory journals that you, can, that you can target to try to get your, your own research published. And we have for early career researchers a how to get published guide. So all of this information is on our website. We'd really encourage you to go and look at it. And you can follow us on these different channels. And so now I'd really like to open up the, the floor to any questions. Thank you very much for all that information, Carol. Uh, so as Carol mentioned, 
Uh, you do have the opportunity now to ask any questions that you would like. So if you do have any, please feel free to send those to us using the chat function. We have had a couple of questions come through during the webinar so far, so we're going to just address those um, first of all. Uh, the first one that we're going to look at is uh, can complex combination of search terms be stored to be used later, um, which is something that was um, later covered in the presentation. Um, but Carol, I wondered if you had anything further that you'd like to add to that um, with regards to saving search terms. Yeah, um, to do it, you definitely want to set up a, an account within Web of Science so you're able to set up your own personal account within there and then use the, the saving, um, save your search. So it should be pretty straightforward and it's very worthwhile to do because if some, as, as I'm sure you know, some, some searches can be quite involved. Um, as is the case with almost anything, it might also be a good idea to just copy the search string which is very easy to do as it appears on the upper left side of your screen and save that somewhere to as backup. Thank you very much. The next question that we have is, is there a difference between putting each term in a different box and using the Boolean operators and A and E in the same field? So when you yeah. at the search function, you used uh, different boxes to search rather than including them in the same box? So what you can do, there's, there's not really a difference. I'm going to go back to the, um, excuse me, I can't, I can't type and talk at the same time. That's I'm going, Carol. Um, I'll take over. No, 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 I'm going to, I'm just about there. So let me double check. Is the search screen showing? We have the results screen at the moment. Okay, perfect. So if I go back to search. So here I've used different boxes for each of my search terms. Um, if they are, and so if they're a different concept, and then put them if they are the same concept and connected with or in a single search box. So it would be the same search if I typed it like this. So if I moved that and typed my own and, and then here, it's a bit tricky. It's very important that if you're going to, if you wanna do it this way, that you put the or parts of your search. So the concepts where it's a single concept but captured by different words inside brackets or, or um, parentheses. So I can do it all in a single box if I want to. It's hard to see in this particular search. And so this will, when I hit search, do exactly the same thing as though I had had it broken down into the four boxes. I personally think it's really easy to keep them in the different boxes because that's a nice visual of thinking this is a different concept and different concept. And I would warn against using the boolean or if you're going to have some ands in in a search as well because without keeping it captured together with a bracket you don't have as much control over exactly what the database how it's interpreting your search string so if you have the or things within brackets then you know that the database will search that together as a single um look for all the flavor or flavor or flavor or umami records first before combining it with soy sauce and fermentation, if that makes sense. So I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, please let us know and I'll try again. 
Thank you, Carol. Yes, um, I believe you have answered the question quite clearly, but just as a summary there, so I see that it's possible to do it either way, um, but perhaps might be more beneficial to you when searching to do the way that you showed us with the different boxes so that we have more control over the uh, information that we find as well as being able to combine searches and other features later. Yeah, well, it's you can have as much control in a single search box. It's just harder to see. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Okay, um, we've also just had a, a note through from Marissa from Clarivate just to add to the discussion that we've just been having to say that searches, previous searches can also be saved and viewed from the search history page as well. Um, so that is something that we can, uh, we can show you quickly, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so here, here you have your search history. Um, which looks a lot like when we scroll down in the um, advanced search tab and you can see that we have the option here to save our history or create a, res um, create a result. And so I've got my um, account not working because it's not my, um, my actual email address. I could set up a new alert now so I could do a soy sauce alert and it will email me whenever this happens to come through. And you can see that I could save all of, I could save any of these that I wanted to as well. And I can also open up my saved history from previous previous save, things that I've saved. But I'm not really sure what's going to appear here. Mm -hmm. so, remember you. what searches I may have run in the past. <laughs> Thank you. And Marissa yeah. from Clarivate has also just said that the alerts default to weekly, but can be changed to daily or monthly as well. So that's another feature that you can take advantage of. Okay. Thank you so much for adding that, Marissa. Thank you. Okay. So, Alternatively, you don't have any further questions now, but they come to mind later, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us, either through social media or directly via email. All of the great resources that Carol mentioned are available on our website for you to access at any time. This includes our training resources that are available on demand, accessed from the training page of the website and available on YouTube. We hope that you find these very useful. You'll also Thanks. find details of future webinars on the website. We've recorded this session and we'll be sending the recording out to everyone who attended afterwards. And uh, at the end of today's webinar, you'll be directed to a questionnaire about your experience today. We would be very grateful for any feedback that you're able to supply so that we can ensure that future webinars are as beneficial as possible and expand our services in order to best support our customers and the food science community. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and I hope you've enjoyed this look into searching and gained a better understanding of the FSTA search process. We hope that FSTA continues to be a valuable tool in your food science research. Thank you so very much for coming today and I do hope it helped.